so okay so you may start yeah okay so let us just uh, go through uh, this lecture slowly and uh, people ask feel free to ask me any questions so here i introduce this uh, algebra which has which which starts with the 3 by 3 matrix ring with entries in an octonian algebra so octonian algebras are non associative so this ring m3c is also therefore non associative and on that we can define an involution starting from a diagonal uh, matrix with entries in the field uh, invertible entries in the field uh, which is x goes to gamma inverse x bar transpose gamma x bar transpose has the usual meaning bar is the canonical involution on the octonian algebra and then you look at the space of hermitian matrices so x star equal to x so these are the symmetric matrices so to say with respect to the involution and uh, he of course this is not closed under usual mat matrix product so to make it closed you just uh, define this new product where here by dot i mean the usual matrix product and this is the new product on the left hand side so x y is half of x dot y plus y dot x yeah we can go down shripad so this is obviously going to be commutative and uh, non associative and the dimension of this algebra can be counted as 3 for the diagonal entries and 3 times dimension of c or off diagonal entries and these algebras uh, satisfy this weak associativity property so in fact such and this has this is the identity element and algebras which satisfy this identity along with commutativity are usually called jordan algebras but i did not mention it here and then i mentioned some features of this algebra there is a trace linear form then it induces a quadratic form Uh, as usual and this uh, if this is the bilinear form corresponding to the trace linear form then uh, it is sat it satisfies again some associativity property which will come in the next page i think and then every element in this algebra satisfies a cubic polynomial if you notice this is the usual characteristic equation of a 3 by 3 matrix as we know actually because this is qx is just half trace x square and this is half of trace x square so that is the usual uh, so this equation is exactly what we know for 3 by 3 matrices and you define this constant here as determinant of x it is the usual determinant but computed carefully so uh, because we are in non associative situation okay so next page So Any here, uh, this uh, determinant definition is just determinant x equal to the other side, right? Yeah, usual. Uh, yes. Yes. You okay. can compute determinant x by computing powers of x and so on. Correct. Yeah. Okay. But <laughs> computing powers of x or determinant, neither of them is an easy job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But definition is dt x equal to the other side. Okay. Correct. Correct. Okay. and uh, because of the uh, that equation it follows immediately that uh, a matrix here is invertible if and only if its determinant is non zero and uh, the fifth property very important which is i have just listed it here it's a theorem to be proven but we skip the proof that any automorphism of this algebra where by automorphism you mean the usual it preserves the trace linear form and the determinant uh, therefore also the quadratic form and uh, this is the associativity property i mentioned so bracket of xy with z is bracket of x with yz for all xyz and uh, yeah so this this is here we are allowing all possibilities complex uh, i mean uh, dimension 1 2 or 4 and when the dimension is 8 you have what are called albert algebras so we go down shripad
ha huh. so uh, in this i mentioned what happens when c is 1 2 or 4 dimensional these are the associative uh, composition algebras then of course m3 c is an associative ring but our this algebra is still non associative because of the twisted way we defined the multiplication however the involution that i defined this star involution happens to be what is called an orthogonal involution uh, i will maybe skip the details of this unitary involution or the symplectic involution so roughly speaking this uh, means there is a quadratic form hidden behind this means there is a hermitian form hidden behind and this means there is an alternating or symplectic form hidden behind the picture and then you compute the automorphism group it may be of course in some cases disconnected the connected component gives you classical groups which are of those possible types so either you'll get an orthogonal group or a unitary group or a symplectic group uh, so, so these, these are your oh i'm sorry say shripath kuch bol rahe hain so these uh, possibilities are uh, respective right meaning when it is uh, yes, yes 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. i i did not say that yeah okay so next is to discuss the definition of albert algebras and say their connections with f4 so let us start first with the, the split uh, octonian algebra over the field k shripath you can go down so when you take the split al uh, octonian algebra one can show in fact for any composition split algebra here if you put uh, take any gamma then it is isomorphic to h3 of c with identity involution in that case we just denote it by h3c and uh, when c is octonian we call this the split albert algebra we will soon uh, show that automorphisms of h3c or the split albert algebra is the split group of type f4 and the definition of an albert algebra is by base changing uh, so twisted forms of this algebra essentially so by base changing to some field extension you should get uh, this uh, split albert algebra so and one yes so here a tensor l will be h3c right not tensor on the right l uh the definition no so i am starting with c over k ah this c over k okay no ah, c is over k so this is same as h3 of c tensor l also c tensor l right, right yeah so because c is defined over k the tensor can be taken out actually this is more information than pushing l inside so i wrote it like this and uh, in the literature these are uh, these algebras h3c gammas are called reduced albert algebras when uh, c may not be split they just a bad terminology but that has stuck on and these are the algebras precisely which have zero divisors and uh, by descent uh, which means basically some galois argument one can show that any albert algebra remember that means uh, twisted form of the uh, split albert algebra any such algebra has those features yeah you can go to the next page any question so far uh, of course uh, i got some questions but more are welcome any time now uh, as i said to prove uh, Uh, to do various things about the automorphism group uh, we need to compute the dimension we need to show the group is connected etc we look for a suitable variety on which the group should act transitively and so that money yes. can i ask one okay. ah, so, yes so when we begin with this c uh, to be just octonian yeah like in the other page and then we define this uh, albert algebra yeah so if c is like uh, th then the h3 c gamma also has two possibility either it will be split or uh, reduced no 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 it okay. is uh, c is uh, of course if c is split then h3 c gamma is split what by definition right it is called split then 
and okay. its automorphism group will be a split group but okay. if c is not split then the group will not be split uh, so the c c has two possibility like either it will be split or anisotropic right uh, so correct if we, if we begin with the anisotropic and then we construct then the there may be a, a possibility of getting an isotropic group or even an anisotropic group is possible so oh, i will I speak about this in my uh, next lecture okay okay in between yeah. it can happen okay, okay yeah yeah there are possibilities okay. so by as usual we define an idempotent as an element whose square is itself and uh, we define it to be primitive let me just forget this absolutely here just to abbreviate if uh, it if you cannot decompose it as sum of two idempotents whose product is zero one can then show that uh, this such an idempotent has trace one or equivalently the quadratic form q evaluated is gives you value half so that is another equivalent definition of a primitive idempotent so we will of course automorphisms will take such an idempotent to another such idempotent so it automorphism group acts on the set of such primitive idempotents so we go low stripper so here is a fact which uh, i am going to assume that when the field is algebraically closed mind you this is not true uh, when the field is not closed i mean we need this condition this is sufficient condition it may happen that over some fields uh, still you get transitivity but to ensure that always you assume k is algebraically closed then the automorphism group acts actually transitively on the set of primitive idempotents so we would like to see this as a variety so we will see how to do that so absolute uh, so this condition of uh, whatever i defined should hold over all scalar extensions that is part of the definition that's what absolutely primitive means which i uh, so i it is certainly primitive in the sense it, you cannot decompose it like this but this should hold over all possible scalar extensions that is the notion of primitivity so we are working with such idempotents and soon we will see that uh, let's go down yeah so let's work with those now so let's take a primitive fix fix a primitive idempotent u in a albert algebra like this and you look at this space which is the orthogonal complement of e and u together so you are essentially looking at the intersection of trace zero elements and uh, the i mean perp of the so yeah intersection of trace zero elements in u perp that is what this is so you are looking at those elements which are orthogonal to the idempotent and have trace zero uh, i have a question yes so clearly identity element is not a primitive idempotent not at all yeah but we, we can write identity as sum of primitive idempotents yes three the diagonal we will come to that so the diagonal and we start with any primitive idempotent we can find two others such that there is some yes, identity yes exactly that is true but i did not mention it maybe i it will come next page so uh, for the moment let us look at this space e which is the orthogonal complement of u intersected with trace zero part on that uh, trace quadratic form is non degenerate and the associativity property of the uh, bilinear form implies that multiplication by u maps e to e so this map actually goes from e to e so this is following from these equations right so if you recall that map as t then you also see that t is symmetric in the sense it is its own transpose with respect to this bilinear form and uh, here is a shocking <laughs> uh, truth that t square is half of t 
so this is a very non trivial thing uh, i i got a big shock as i said last time also when i was studying these objects usually idempotent square is itself so you would expect the equation to be t square equal to t but because of non associativity something creepy happens and you get t square equal to half t so zero and half are the eigen values of this operator on e uh, so manish yeah. so on it three ga c gamma we have that uh, different definition of the product so there for any element x x square is 1 by 2 of x uh, usual the product right because we have defined x y no, no, x square is x square oh yes coincide. because it's it will, will coincide with the usual okay 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 so right. this is indeed a very surprising thing yeah 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 oh this is not very surprising you are saying yeah that's what i had uh, thought but it is but i was wrong yeah it is surprising because you are applying you would expect u when you hit again this by u you will get back ux but that doesn't happen <laughs> because u doesn't associate anymore with ux yeah so you look, let ei denote the zero and half eigen space of this operator so zero is the z usual so tx equal to zero and the other one is uh, 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 next page triple yeah so those uh, eigen spaces i want to describe how they look like so first of all let's denote by a12 Uh, these matrices. So these are the el typical elements in. Uh, so I have just put zeros here. So this is the first uh, row, second column. There is some entry, and this is the Hermitian image of that. So you can think of diagonal as Hermitian mirror. So you are putting something here, then its image, mirror image is coming here with a bar. A two three is second row, third column, some entry. Then its Hermitian image. similarly a13 is defined let's call uh, u as u1 then as shripad pointed out you can uh, in fact let's look at the standard diagonal idempotents 1 0 0 0 1 0 and 0 0 then their sum is the identity element and with respect to this first one u equal to u1 you will calculate easily that e1 is A one two plus A one three. So this is A one two and this is A one three. So these two corners will be filled up and similar and their images. The rest of it will be zero. So E E one E one remember is the half eigen space for the operator T. This is sixteen dimensional. And E zero, which is the uh, kernel for uh, T. that is nine dimensional and it is described as this this space and because of transitivity this is pretty much complete picture for any primitive idempotent so i, I we can assume uh, our first uh, our primitive idempotent is the first idempotent here and then work with it so that was the idea i gave this computation to you the so dimension e1 is 16 and dimension e0 is 9 now let's denote by g bar the automorphism group of uh, a as an algebraic group and let's denote by g bar u those automorph the group of those automorphisms which fix u okay so we want to compute the isotropy we already have transitive action so we are trying to compute the isotropy to get hold of the orbit dimension so here uh, because this group is fixing u it maps the eigen spaces to themselves so zero eigen space is stabilized as well as the half eigen space is stabilized by uh, this group gu okay okay so far any questions going well yeah hmm this uh, t yeah. that is defined by left multiplication by u that is just Correct. k linear Yes, yes, of course. Uh, uh, so, no, the question is: Is it also K algebra? Uh, no, 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 no. It's a vector space map. Just vector space. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's only left multiplication by a scalar cannot be an algebra. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Will not map identity to identity, so it's not an algebra map. Yes. It's only a vector space map. And then I made some uh, definitions of Clifford algebra and so on, so we can uh, pass this triple. Uh, I hope people. I just made it so that uh, you know it looks complete. So I defined the notion of spin group here. So we can pass this also. Okay, then uh, I want to say the theorem. Suppose uh, u is a primitive idempotent. Uh, in fact, the first first one u equal to u. I I should have said here the diagonal one actually. Then for x uh, equal to this matrix, which is in E zero, we have the q value. You just you can compute it by hand. It turns out to be this. Remember, q of x is half of trace x square, so that turns out to be this. And then the isotropy uh, of the automorphism group at u. U is the first diagonal idempotent. That is isomorphic to spin group of E naught with quadratic form q. And this isomorphism you can write down explicitly, which is what we did actually. G u maps e E zero to E zero, and that is that gives you this isomorphism. So we will uh, forget the details. So this this group we know now. It's the nine dimen. I mean, spin group of the nine dimensional space E zero with Q. So this implies that the set of uh, so not implies. Sorry, the set of idempotents in A K is of course a variety because U square is U is an equation, and we are looking at solutions of that. So that is a variety. And something is primitive if and only if the q value is half or trace is one. So therefore, we indeed have a variety. Now uh, we want to show, of course, it is irreducible and so on. I gave some reason for that here. Uh, basically, uh, you can yeah you can skip this proof. It's an irreducible variety of dimension sixteen because it is. Uh, isomorphic to an open subset of E1. So I gave you an isomorphism, primitive idempotents. So basically, this variety V, the variety of primitive idempotents, uh, is a union of three Zariski open subsets V1, V2, V3, and each one, actually V1, for example, is isomorphic to a certain Zariski open subset of E1. So I have given that isomorphism here. You can see any such. This is how primitive idempotents look like in V1, and you will map a typical such a thing to this Y. So anyway, the point is, it's a 16-dimensional uh, irreducible variety. You can see the details of these things in uh, Springer's book. And uh, now the theorem is that. Uh, the automorphism group is connected, simple, uh, defined over K of type F4. So this this is uh, the usual thing we did. So we have an irreducible variety and a transitive action of this, and the isotropy is spin nine. So that gives you the dimension is fifty two, and because V is irreducible and this isotropy is connected, you get the group is connected as well. Yes, yeah, Shripal, we can go down. Mm. Uh, please ask questions. Uh, any questions are welcome. Anything, uh, even in earlier lectures, or uh, I, I generally am very uh, inaccurate in what I say. Somehow that has become my way of teaching. <laughs> also, <laughs> I make lots of mistakes in my class, and my students uh, catch me. So okay, so yeah. why, uh, why G is connected? Just because of the spin? Or? Yes, yes. Spin okay. group is connected. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that isomorphism is explicit. So that, uh, yeah. So that is connected. So and the variety is irreducible. So okay. the group is connected. Okay. And next uh, important thing is that the space of trace zero elements. We want to show. Is an irreducible representation for faithful irreducible for uh, the automorphism group, and then we will get reductivity from there. So to prove this, what you do is first observe 
that this group isotropy of uh, u leaves uh, this invariant of course because this is automorphism so it will leave this in fact point wise fixed uh, this is trivial representation of dimension 1 this is irreducible of dimension 9 and this is irreducible of dimension 16 for spin uh, of nine dimensional space these are all irreducible representations and uh, we know that automorphism group acts transitively so uh, on the variety of primitive idempotents so those uh, spaces will get permuted uh, by with respect to different idempotents so that will show you that prove it to you that G bar is uh, irreducible on the uh, trace zero elements, right? Is that okay, Shripal? So, uh, so this G bar is <coughs> like it inside GL twenty six. Uh, yes. Uh, so, can we say? So, like GL uh, that twenty six dimensional space is a direct sum of three uh, spaces I wrote down. Right. That was with respect to U. Okay. Okay. Now you take another, uh, let's say another orthogonal primitive idempotent to U, for example. Okay. Then you get another uh, decomposition, and because the automorphism group is transitive, right. there will be an automorphism mapping U to U prime. Right. So it will disturb those irreducible summands now. If U is getting mapped to U prime, then E zero U will get mapped to E zero U prime. Right. Similarly, E one will uh, E one U will get mapped to E one U prime. So G bar cannot be in leaving those things invariant. But how do we know that E one U and E two U are different? Meaning E one suppose U and V are two primitive idempotents. Ah. Huh. How do we know that their E nots are different? Meaning we have to show that you know there is. No. Ah. Huh. So that is that is some calculation that I I I will tell you. so the point is for example first look at the first one the fixed uh, one dimensional irreducible right right yeah. if those two are yes. equal you can prove easily for example e minus 3u will become some multiple of e minus 3u prime and now you play with this equation together with the fact that trace of u and u prime have to be one etc that will okay. lead due to a contradiction so but what about e not and other things meaning similar calculations it's not similar difficult. calculations will yeah, yeah. Okay. similar calculations okay the point is that this this group fixes only u no this is this is what i did this calculation on the one dimensional subspace will tell you that if g bar u is equal to g bar u prime then u must be u prime a uh, just another side question so yeah. the group g bar is acting transitively on the primitive idempotents mm. now we look at this uh, g bar u which fixes u yes how would it act on the remaining uh, primitive idempotents is it how? still an irreducible transitive action or is it uh, some who who what the action is it group the isotropy subgroup isotropy subgroup uh, well it it won't do anything it will do something we don't know it will not fix those idempotents is what you can say okay but the two remaining ones that you will get to make up identity from u yeah they will not be fixed their sum will be fixed their sum will be fixed yeah okay they they will not be fixed well it, we don't know i mean <laughs> i i i haven't studied that but maybe one gets permuted to the other that is allowed uh -huh. but it may not yeah, happen switching switching may be possible yeah but that that may not happen i one, one can see perhaps even that won't happen but anyway the sum will be fixed yes yeah so this irreducibility is following from transitivity so i leave that to you uh, you can look up the details or just argue it yourself it's not difficult So, so indeed. And one more stupid question: yes. Why is it faithful? Ah, uh, because uh, you have trace zero elements uh, on that. That is irreducible. Uh, yes. So, if something uh, non-trivial fixes the trace zero part, then it already fixes k. 
it, so it fixes the identity, whole so it is the trivial automatic so identity right? element okay all right okay so and center is trivial follows using schur's lemma so you will get similar argument as i mentioned just now uh, so if something is central then it is a scalar homotety on the 26 dimensional space uh, and then uh, on e not it should be a rotation and e not is odd dimensional etc we i remembered faintly we did argue something like that that implies the scalar must be trivial so this shows the group is semi simple right shibal yes yes and then uh, you can argue that it's like this you can write it as uh, product of g1 g2 gr where gi is are simple and this uh, happens here typical thing now to continue the proof uh, you look at these projection maps onto these gis these are simple factors so onto gis you have projection maps and because g the isotropic group gu sits here not all the projections of gu will be trivial so there will be some projection operator on gu which will have non trivial image without loss of generality we can assume the first projection operator is non trivial on gu and then its image at the dimension of the image must be 36 because gu is simple gu is 36 dimensional and uh, the image is non trivial implies immediately that dimension of the image is 36 right because kernel of right. yeah. i1 will be a finite subgroup here so the image must be 36 dimensional and image is contained in g1 so dimension of g1 is at least 36 yeah. and that really puts our life in uh, an envelope it actually we can't move too much dimension is 52 total dimension so that tells you that other projections must be trivial for gu and that shows gu must be contained in g1 and now you use the fact that gi is all other than i equal to 1 centralized g1 they also centralized gu etc and again i am using here that uh, gu fixes no other idempotent that tells you that this uh, any normalizer element must fix u so normalizer of gu is itself and that tells you gi's are all contained in gu for all i bigger than 1 etc that shows r equal to 1 so our uh, group is simple from there okay it's a very interesting argument i feel very strange uh, coincidences i feel huh? <laughs> not very it's a lucky did, argument did we in fact show that g bar is a gu bar no you have proved that all gi are contained in gu and uh, i bigger than 1 i bigger than 1 okay so they therefore they are trivial yeah yeah okay right so type of uh, g bar is f4 follows by observing uh, that dimensions of any classical group has certain form and 52 is not like this i mean i find all this rather uh, not very satisfactory no it could be that this argument doesn't work of course then somebody would have found some other proof but this proof is uh, some of very lucky proof no then we would have had to find the maximal torus and yes yes root. dirty so, our hands more correct yeah. so the corollary is that uh, for any albert algebra now it could be even a division algebra then g the automorphism group is simple of type f4 and defined over k etc require some work but let's go past that and any such group arises this way this is a little bit of galois cohomology argument needed here along with the fact that uh, f4 is its own automorphism group So, so when uh, here we are getting the adjoint type f4 no yeah um, no this is uh, yeah adjoint type f4 is also simply connected f4 f4 has uh, no center and uh, it's simply connected as well as adjoint 
Oh, oh okay, okay. So, so then, okay, okay. So this is both adjoint and simply then. Mm. So that will be used here to say that any group of type F4 arises like this. Okay. So that so is why I mean, automorphism is the whole group. Like automorphism group is the group. Correct. So okay. I had sketched an argument in this tutorial session for G2. The same argument, exactly same argument works here. Okay. And did we also use the simply connectedness of F4 to write it down as a explicit direct product of simple groups, right? Otherwise, there yes. could have been some finite. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Correct. You are right. Because otherwise, there would be something in the bottom and then uh, that would not be, that would give a covering for non trivial covering. You are right. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so, uh, so, center is trivial. Uh, therefore, uh, therefore yeah, but uh, you see the GIs may have some uh, some common finite centers and then it is usually almost direct product okay right? but center trivial won't imply that this is uh, direct yeah center product. trivial does imply but you cannot write it as a direct product unless the center is trivial yeah. Meaning, you know, you may have two simple groups, you take their direct product and go modulo a finite central part. Correct. That is still a semi simple group. Yeah, that is correct. But here we first prove the center is trivial and the group and is. And then we write it as product of simple groups. So center right. being trivial is being used. Do you also mean that it's semi simple, right? If it doesn't have a center? So, yes. So once there is no center, then it also becomes semi simple. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm yes. really sorry, my. Uh, uh, okay, where are we now? Sorry. So now um, we could uh, discuss uh, isometries of determinant if you okay, want. Okay, so to. F4 yeah. case is settled. But uh, Riddhi had some question, I yes, guess. Yes, so. yes, yes. No, no, I just uh, made a comment because you see, he said it's reductive and center is trivial. So I said then <coughs> it has to be also semi simple, right? Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Reductive, therefore, the uh, and center trivial means yeah, it is I mean, semi simple it's a trivial and simply connected. Correct. Yes. Okay, so going to the next uh, group is the groups of group of isometries. Actually, one can uh, I should have said here. I can look at not necessarily isometries. I can look at norm similarities. So, but we should be happy here. This is the semi-simple part of that. So, let's take any Albert algebra <clears throat> and look at those uh, linear operators uh, at the level of uh, algebraic groups that leave the determinant invariant or fixed. And then because of characteristic assumptions, you know, I must also remark here that though I assume characteristic is different from two and three and doing these things, one can uh, do all this in general characteristic with some different uh, uh, adjustments. So the theory is complete. So here uh, you can uh, trilinearize this uh, cubic form to get a symmetric trilinear form and uh, arrange matters so that at a matrix X uh, or an element X, you get the cubic form evaluated at X. So that can be arranged. So Freudenthal was the first one to define this so-called cross product goes from A cross A to A using this uh, trilinear form and the bilinear uh, quadratic form, bilinear symmetric form We're coming from the trace. <clears throat> and uh, you define here uh, using the non-degeneracy of this uh, form, bilinear form, you can start with any T and uh, define T star from A to A, uh, which is actually the contra gradient in the sense transpose inverse with respect to the trace bilinear form. So it goes from A to A, okay? And the definition is T x comma T star y is x comma y for all x y. This is the definition of T star. Then in easy to check that T star star is T and then T star preserves the product. Uh, so this therefore gives us the following proposition. So if A is reduced uh, Albert algebra over K and I look at all 
endomorphisms of A which preserve the determinant, then the condition uh, for T in GL A to be in H is if and only if this equation is satisfied. And uh, <clears throat> if T is in H, then T star also is in H and you get an outer automorphism of H of order 2. And as I remarked before also, this is happening at all uh, field scalar extensions of K. So this will be an algebraic group outer automorphism of H. So this is something that we will use later. And uh, because there is a fact here that the cubic form is actually irreducible polynomial. And that tells you that the norm one variety, so look at all those X in the Albert algebra over K, capital K, which have determinant one. That's a irreducible variety of dimension 26 because you're cutting down one dimension here <clears throat> and defined over the base field. Then there is some discussion about orbits here. I don't want to, I did not. Uh, so there, you know, when you talk about primitive idempotent variety uh, has action of the automorphism group transitive, this is really what is involved here. But I, I skipped that part. So from here, one can deduce that that action is transitive. But let's forget it for the moment. So I go to the stabilizer at E. So orbits are determined here. So here the point is that given any, uh, sorry, strip a little up. Uh, yeah, so the point is if you take any two uh, uh, elements of uh, A, which have same determinant and the determinant is non-zero, you can attach a certain uh, bi bilinear form to these elements. Namely, this bilinear form is defined as determinant a inverse times the trilinear form evaluated at x, y, a, similarly for b. And then the fact is that they are in the same orbit under h, if and only if these two bilinear forms are equivalent to k. Yeah, any questions? Yeah, this is a rather technical issue. Let's uh, pass this. So stabilizer computation uh, is again a theorem actually that those isometries which fix the identity element actually are automorphisms. So this is not true for G2 case, but in F4 case, uh, we have some more uh, room and it works out here that any norm isometry, actually any norm similarity is also same because automatically if there is a norm similarity, it will be a norm isometry, which if it fixes identity. So the group of all norm isometries which fix the identity is exactly the automorphism group. <coughs> and the theorem is that this is uh, this uh, group of all my norm isometries is simple, simply connected of type E6 defined over K. And proof is very similar to uh, the F4 case. Uh, so here we have the stabilizer computation already. So that gives us the dimension as 78. <coughs> and uh, so look at the automorphism action of uh, automorphism group action. There are these invariant, there are only two invariant subspaces, the one dimensional one and then E per. And uh, H bar leaves neither of these invariant. By writing down, I, I had promised you to uh, give you explicit computations, but I, I did not write them down. And I don't know how to show it to you. But you can see this yourself, actually. Just play with the notions. Then you can write down uh, elements of H lower bar, which you know don't map KE to KE, right? That's, that's not very difficult. Similarly, here. So I'll just skip that part right now. So that also tells us that <coughs> this is a faithful irreducible representation. And so this is reductive, etc. cetera. Schur's lemma uh, uh, tells you that the central element, any central element is a scalar product, scalar multiplication. And then you looking looking at what 
some subgroups do you can conclude the central element must be in mu3 it should be a root of unity and any root cube root of unity must be uh, gives you by scalar multiplication and isometry so center is exactly equal to mu3 so h bar is semi simple and similar argument as f4 uh, though here there is a center you can go modulo the center and argue exactly like f4 case and then you will see that h bar is simple to show h bar is simple it's enough to show h bar mod mu3 is simple and that's what i'm talking about so that is a proof in the book and uh, then together uh, uh, with simplicity and dimension computation gives you possibilities as b6 c6 or e6 so this is interestingly uh, both of them are 78 dimension <laughs> and then you use the fact that h bar has an outer automorphism of order 2 whereas these groups don't so that leaves only type e6 and then center is full so it must be simply connected so this is good yeah and on e7 i just made a remark uh, i will say something about this in the next lecture if i have time Uh, here you write down a 27 uh, sorry 56 dimensional representation of the group uh, which i am not going to tell you anything about actually i am just saying that it supports a quartic form so this is a degree 4 homogeneous polynomial and the group is uh, one example of a group of type e7 is the group of isometries of this form so that is the next result <clears throat> so the it's not connected but connected component of identity uh gives you simply connected group of type e6 t e7 defined over k and if we choose in both the situations a as a split albert algebra then we get split simply connected forms of these groups yeah so this is this is the lecture now we can uh pause and uh, go over whatever people have doubts you can so this shall is the initiative yeah shall i stop sharing or should we uh, i don't know depends if people want explicitly then we can get it back again yeah we can yeah. stop sharing <clears throat> yeah i was having chai and suddenly <laughs> i i had to my god it was horrible so so this gu for a4 when we yes. compute the stabilizer yes this uh, gu will be uh, the torus or no uh, no gu is not torus gu is spin group okay. it's spin of nine dimensional space maybe i under um, did not understand yeah, your yeah, question that is the question like uh, my question was this uh, gu will be a maximal torus or not but it is no, not no no gu gu is spin 9 right, right. if it is yeah. maybe compact that case i don't know hmm. it's a spin of a nine dimensional uh, quadratic space and i wrote down the quadratic space explicitly right right, right. so the the proofs are not easy uh, they are lot of work so i i just uh, mentioned the facts to you you can look up these books uh, various books actually i have i will try to give you a thorough bibliography in my la last lecture so i will include extra couple of sheets mentioning lecture wise uh, references perhaps <clears throat> yeah so also this a4 type group when we computed uh, like the proof there we prove that this group uh, is um, sit inside gl26 right uh, this is correct right yes uh, so uh, yeah next question is is it also sit inside like uh, uh, 
So 26 is the smallest irreducible representation for F4. F4, right. So Shripad, are we recording or recording is off? No, no, the recording is going on. Okay. So maybe uh, Sushil's comment was that spin 9 is a maximal rank subgroup of that F4. But he did not say that he was saying Taurus and so on. So I didn't. I answered uh, depending on the question. <laughs> so you Sushil should ask me again. <laughs> no, no. I now I got the actually. No, but uh, what is correct is what Shripad said. This is a maximal rank because it's a B4, and also it's a maximal subgroup. So it is not contained in any other thing between F4 and B4. There is nothing else. So this is a maximal subgroup. Uh, in that sense, and maximal rank also. Whereas D4, which will come in the next lecture, sits inside B4, but it is not maximal, of course. <coughs> so there is a way to figure out maximal rank, maximal subgroups using Borel D. Zibenthal algorithm. In that, you will uh, catch B4. Okay. So maybe we can, uh, Shripad, maybe we can stop recording uh, and okay. be now more informal. Uh, yeah, sure. People are not asking me questions, so. <laughs> because it will be recorded. 